Good evening, Tabernacle Church. Thank you for tuning in to our online Christmas Eve service. Though we recognize things are different this year, we're glad that you've decided to join us tonight as we take an opportunity to sing together, to pray together, to read and study Scripture, to turn our hearts to the heart of Christmas and to the hope of salvation in Jesus Christ. So I invite you to worship as we uh, enter into this time together, and we hope that this time together will, will truly be an opportunity uh, for us to, again, exalt our Savior and to remember the real meaning of the Christmas season. So as we worship, I invite you to join me as we pray. Father God, we bow before you, grateful that you are a God who has intervened in human history. We thank you, God, that you did not leave us to our sin and to the curse of death itself, but that you made a way through your one and only Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for a season where we remember this Word made flesh, the means of redemption brought to earth to not only be born, but to live a perfect life, to die as a substitute on the cross, to be raised from the dead so that in Him we might be reconciled to you. We thank you, God, for this saving work, for the forgiveness that is given to us in Christ. And we pray that during our time together tonight, that as we sing these songs that draw us to the hope of the Christmas season, and as we, we pray together, as we study your word and remind ourselves of what are these precious truths that surround the Christmas season. Indeed, it would draw our hearts and minds into what this is all about, that it would be an opportunity to, uh, to, to remove distractions from our minds related to circumstances, whether physical or political or other circumstances that we might be facing during these difficult and anxious times, and that we might remember that, that you and your grace have done an ultimate work for us in Christ, and that it is an eternal work. And that we can trust you now, no matter what comes in the days ahead, because we are safe with you forevermore. That's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our final Advent reading this year is Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 5. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Jesus said, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Lord, lay in time, behold him come. 
Now let us read the account of Christ's first advent from the Gospel of Luke. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angels a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into the heavens, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told them.
was not a silent night There was blood on the ground You could hear a woman cry In the alleyway that night On the streets of David's town And the stable was not clean And the cobblestones were cold And little Mary full of grace With the tears upon her face Had no mother's hand to hold It was a labor the cold sky, sky above for the, the girl, girl on, on the ground, ground in the dark with every beat of her beautiful heart, heart it was a labor of love noble joseph by her side callous hands and streets of David's town in the middle of the night so we held her and he prayed shafts of moonlight on his face but the baby in her womb he was the maker of the moon was the author of the faith that could make the mountains move. probably all familiar with the phrase, timing is everything. It's a phrase that recognizes what most of us consider a value, and that is we want things done on time. We want things done at the right time. We want things to happen in time. In fact, there's some examples of this that show the importance of timing being right. 
Timing is the difference between uh, having a, a, a beautiful, velvety, custardy, rich cheesecake or scrambled eggs in a graham cracker crust. Uh, timing is the difference between a beautifully struck golf shot or ending up in the woods. Timing is the difference between getting on a plane and enjoying a, a ride to a, a vacation of a lifetime or spending hours, maybe even overnight in an airport trying to find another flight. Timing is the difference between a bill paid on time and hefty late fees. Timing is the difference between a plan that is effectively executed, achieving whatever objectives you set for it, or failing miserably. Oh, we recognize the importance of timing. Timing is everything. I think this principle is demonstrated in the Christmas story itself. One of the most important summations in the Bible related to the events of the incarnation draws our attention to the fact that this is all about timing. God moved in a very specific, intentional period of time to bring about the events that we know as the Christmas story. It's found in the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. It says it like this, But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Even in the Christmas story itself, we see that timing does matter. God is, is described as moving in the fullness of, of time. Uh, that, that kind of language speaks, again, to precision. God did His work at just the right time, when, when all of the elements were in place, when, when everything was set up the way He wanted it set up. Everything happened in this Christmas story. All of the events that, that were a prelude to it, all of the events surrounding it, that which then came after it, all of this occurred at just the right time, in just the right way, and according to the sovereign plan of God. Now that the Christmas story can be described as the importance of perfect timing. Now, it's important, though, to understand as, as we continue to reflect on this language, and in particular, what Paul goes on to say is the ultimate impact, at least as far as we're concerned, for the work that God accomplished in the fullness of time. It's important to understand that Paul's words here come in a particular context. Really, Paul is concerned with explaining to the churches meeting in the region of Galatia that the means by which people are made right with God is in Christ alone. It is by faith alone. He is impressing upon them the fact that one is not obligated to keep the various observances and rituals of the law, that, that one is not expected to become both a, a, a Jew, a, a Mosaic Jew, keeping the, the, the law of Moses and add Jesus to that. This was one of the early controversies in the church. What does it mean when a Gentile becomes a Christian? Do they then also have to adopt all that is in the Old Testament. Galatians is really a letter that gives one clear answer. No. No, that is not how people are made right with God. And so Paul takes an opportunity then to flesh out that theology with a little more clarity. And in fact, in the previous text, the verses right before the one we just read, and even at the end of chapter 3, Paul is describing what happens in the work of salvation. He uses this analogy of, of, of being transferred from a period of childhood to adulthood. And Paul even describes it like this, that, 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 that as a child, if somebody is a child, even if they are an heir to whatever their father owns, the estate as it were, that if they are still a child, then really their position is no different than the, than the servants in the home. That they're, they're still under a, 
a tutor. They, they're still under authority. They, they are still treated as those who have to be told what to do. There are commands and expectations upon them. And then no, no matter the fact that they are to be heirs, they still live under the, the system that, that even the servants live under. So, so Paul uses this as an analogy, and he says that this is something like life under the law, describing the distinction between unbelievers and believers. The, the, the unbeliever lives under the law. The law serves as a type of tutor, as a, as a guardian or steward, as it were, as a, as a master. Those who are under the law are under its requirements and obligations, and And unfortunately, that's pretty bad news because the law functions in a very important way for the unbeliever. The law functions to demonstrate to the unbeliever God's expectations in order to be right with him. And at the same time, that same law demonstrates that we're unable to keep that law. It it reflects what is our own sin, what is our our own rebellion, what is our own inability to do what is required to make ourselves right with God. And and so Paul describes life under the law as as being being under this kind of a a master, but that, that to become a believer is to come out from under that law and then to enter into what would be quote unquote adulthood, to enter into to, to, to the fully grown son who then enjoys being an heir to the father. Now, now what Paul does here then in verse 4 is, is to describe how God has achieved this. And so that's why he tells us that in the fullness of time, at just the right time, God enacted the plan, God brought to a, 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 at least a, a, a partial climactic moment the work He has always intended to do in Christ. And that is the work that brings us out from under the law and brings us into fellowship with God. Really, when he uses the language of the fullness of time, Paul is kind of drawing off the imagery of pregnancy itself, which is fitting. It's fitting given the fact that he's going to talk about the one who was born of a woman. And and as we think about the Christmas story, we can't help but think about those dramatic events surrounding the birth of Christ, the, the virgin conception. And then that night in Bethlehem, no room at the end. And Mary and Joseph find themselves in a in a stable with, with a manger for a bed and, and giving birth in circumstances that we could hardly imagine. And so it's, it's interesting that then Paul uses imagery that's similar to that, saying all of this happened in the fullness of time. It, it, it happened at just the right moment. Again, all of the historical and political and cultural and social aspects lined up. And it's in just this moment that God sends a Savior. Sending the means by which we can be brought out from under the tutelage of the law, the domination of the law, submission to that law, under the judgment of that law, and can then be brought into the fullness of a relationship with God and being then heirs with Christ. So so this is really a profound promise. The Christmas story does represent an amazing moment. Now, it's important to understand that language of fullness of time should not be understood to mean God is taking advantage of a series of really fortunate coincidences. Instead, when Paul says this happens in the fullness of time, he means this is happening in accordance with a carefully crafted series of events that God has been orchestrating. Since the Garden of Eden, God God has been working His plan to this point. Now, it's then important to ask, well, what exactly did happen in the fullness of time? I mean, why was this such an important moment? What exactly transpires? Well, what's interesting is Paul then follows up this phrase 
with three other phrases, phrases that identify for us what are essential realities about Jesus. Why was this moment so important? And why is the birth of Jesus, or, or, or even beyond that, what we would call the incarnation? Well, why is it this moment when, when God comes in the flesh, the Word made flesh and dwelling among us, why is this moment so important? What transpires in this fullness of time? Well, Paul then goes on to identify for us what are three essential realities about Jesus that describe this fullness of time. This is the fullness of time because in this moment, God provided three essential realities about Jesus. All three of these have to be true in order for us to know salvation, in order for Him to be able to accomplish His work. So so notice these three. First, the text tells us that Jesus has to be fully God. So again, if you look at verse 4, it says, But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth His Son. So the first thing Paul identifies for us, the first thing that happens in this fullness of time is God sending His Son. Now, when you first hear that and read that, Perhaps you don't necessarily think, well, that's a phrase that identifies Jesus as divine, until you recognize that the reference to Jesus as the Son of God is rich with Old Testament significance. The Son of God is an Old Testament messianic title. It is a divine title. Make no mistake about it, when Paul says God sent forth His Son, he was making a very clear and plain statement. Jesus Christ was not created by God in that the Son of God did not exist until God made Him exist. Paul is making the clear statement that the Son of God The second person of the Trinity was in existence in eternity past, and in this moment, this fullness of time, the Son of God then was enfleshed. But it is a way to identify for us the absolute, full divinity of Jesus Christ. Jesus was 100% percent God. And again, that language of God sending forth His Son, that that again just reemphasizes this sovereign work of God, that this was done in the fullness of of time, that time coming to where it came to because, because God orchestrated those events and then God sending forth His Son because His Son, the second person of the Trinity, was already living in existence and had, had eternally dwelt with God the Father, and now was sent on the mission designed by the triune God in order to save. So God sent forth His Son. This, this identifies for us one, one important essential reality. The only way that we can be saved is for God to come and do it Himself. That's what the law demonstrates. We cannot save ourselves. We have no capacity or ability to make ourselves right with God. God must do something for us and to us. So God has to come in order to make this possible. But then there's a second phrase that identifies a second essential, and that is Jesus has to also be fully man. Notice that next phrase in verse 4. God sent forth His Son, born of a woman. See, you take out that phrase and you take out that that entire understanding, take out the entire Christmas story, and salvation cannot take place. It is not enough to just send forth the Son of God. The Son of God had to be born of a woman. Again, that is the language of the incarnation. That This is demonstrating for us that Jesus was not just somebody who appeared, you know, magically and mystically at the age of 30, uh, some kind of apparition or manifestation of the Son of God appearing to be human but not actually human. 
It's actually a very ancient heresy that the church wrestled with for a couple of centuries. No, no, this phrase right here makes it plain that the Son of God existed in eternity past, but then there was this moment, this fullness of time, when the Son of God was enfleshed, born of a woman, speaks to an important reality. Jesus had to be fully man. God has to come and save, but for salvation to be made possible, we also need a man to do it for us. See, because the problem is sin entered into the world because of man. The Bible makes it clear we all live under the headship of Adam. That, 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 that Adam is, is the one who is our first earthly father, and what do we inherit from him but a sin nature? And this is, this is Romans chapter 5. So what do we need? We need a better Adam. We need a second Adam. We need one who is perfect and remains that way. And the implication is we need one who is human. We need Jesus to be fully God, but we also need him to be fully man. This, by the way, goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. In that moment where God, in the midst of pronouncing judgment on the serpent in relation to the sins of Adam and Eve and, and the serpent's temptation, in the midst of pronouncing that judgment, God also gives a promise. And he says that from the seed of Eve would be the one who would crush the head of the serpent. In other words, there needed to be one born of woman. It wasn't enough that God would just show up in some other divine manifestation. An angel was not going to be a sufficient means of accomplishing this task. And we know that, that even the animal sacrifices that God calls for in the Old Testament ultimately are insufficient because they had to be done again and again and again. So what we need is this perfect combination, fully God fully man. If Jesus is any less God, salvation is not possible. If he's any less man, then the sacrifice is not sufficient. He has to be both, both in its fullness. A man has to come in order to save men from their sins. So here, here we have an important reality. We need, we need Jesus to be fully God and we need Jesus to be fully man. And so let's emphasize this. Let's make sure we understand what this means. I recognize it's fairly weighty theology, but it's critical. And this is the Christmas story. This is why all of these elements are so important. Jesus is 100% God and 100% man. He's not 50-50. He's not some kind of weird mixture of both, as if God had some divine mixing bowl in heaven where he put some divinity in there and some humanity in there and whisked it up, and that is what was born through Mary. No, the, the, the Bible and theology and salvation itself requires us to understand this. Perfectly God. Perfectly man. Because only in man can the sins of men be atoned for. But this leads to a third essential, because this is a problem. I don't just need fully God and fully man. I also need to know that that sacrifice is going to be accepted by God. And the only way that's going to happen is if Jesus also is fully obedient. Jesus has to be fully God, he has to be fully man, and he has to be fully obedient. Notice that next phrase in verse 4. He concludes this verse by saying, not only is he God, not only is he the Son of God sent forth by God, born of a woman, but born under the law. This has been the point that Paul has been making. Jesus had to be born under the law. He had to come up under what was that same set of truths and God's commands that stand against us. So he's, he's born under that law, but there's a reason why he's born under the law. Because we need one, we need a man, fully man, yet at the same time fully God, who can perfectly keep and fulfill the law. This is why this fullness of time is in fact the fullness of time, because this is the moment where this one 
meets all three of these criteria. Jesus is one who is going to live perfectly according to the law. He's he's going to match all of the obligations and, and religious and ethical obligations. In fact, Jesus himself is going to describe his own ministry as that which isn't sent to abolish the law, but to fulfill it and to fulfill what is described as every jot and tittle, meaning even the littlest bit. We might would say that in our own day as as dotting every I and crossing every T and making sure every, every period and comma is in place. In other words, Jesus kept it down to, to the most precise and exacting of degrees. It wasn't that he was generally obedient. It wasn't that he was mostly obedient. It wasn't that he gets an A or an A plus or a passing grade. It was perfection. And this is necessary. If we are going to know salvation, because Jesus' sacrifice required for him to be able to function as a perfect, spotless, blameless sacrifice, and at the same time, he had to offer it as a perfect and blameless priest unto God. So that's why all of these qualities come together. That's why the birth of Christ matters so much, because if something goes wrong here, If something goes wrong at this moment, then the whole plan falls apart. In fact, this this explains an important reality. Some might would think, well, shouldn't we define the cross and the resurrection as the fullness of time? And to be sure, all of these things happen in the fullness of time. But, But Paul's very specific. He's identifying the incarnation, the moment of Christ's birth. That's because if this does not happen this way, And then the cross is ineffective. These truths that we hold dear during the Christmas season are essential to the gospel itself. Jesus had to be fully God, fully man, and fully obedient in order to be a perfect sacrifice for our sins. And so I think we can say timing is everything. I mean, this represents, this, this event, this, this that we celebrate tomorrow morning as you get up and you do all the things that are associated with Christmas and, and however your, your family celebrates it, I implore you to take opportunity to ground your heart and mind in this, that on this day we remember a perfect God, a perfect man, perfect in his obedience making it possible that we would know a perfect salvation. And so let us remember this Savior. Let let us remember the hope, the love, and the joy, and the forgiveness, the comfort, the peace that comes from knowing Christ. I think we're all ready to see 2020 in the rearview mirror and so as we bring this year to a close and as we, as we are just in its final days, maybe we can set aside what has been some fear, some anxiety, some uncertainty, whether it's about our health or about our country and, 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 and we're not sure what 2021 will bring, but because God moved in the fullness of time 2,000 years ago, we can be certain that no matter what 2021 brings our way, we are God's people if we have confessed we are sinners and we have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, crucified, resurrected, placing our faith in Him and Him alone. And we can rejoice this Christmas season. We'll be able to rejoice next Christmas season, regardless of what may transpire. Because God in the fullness of time has done for us what we could not do for ourselves so that we might be adopted into this family of God. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank You again, for this glorious work of salvation. We thank you for this fullness of time. We thank you for the the birth of our Savior, that in Him we have God made flesh, fully God, fully man, obedient to the ultimate degree, so that in Him and on the cross would be found a perfect and acceptable in your sight sacrifice so that we might be saved. Father, let us give our hearts and minds to this during this Christmas season. Let us not be too distracted by the other things associated with Christmas. And and may, may our hearts be drawn into worship and into gratitude 
because of the good work you have done for us in Christ Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.